No man should have cowboy boots in his wardrobe, unless you're a cowboy, of course. Paul Weller. Pop quiz. Who's the most famous cowboy of all time? Buffalo Bill, Wyatt Earp, Billy the Kid, Jesse James, Will Rogers, Gene Autry, Butch Cassidy, John Wayne. And I know some of you guys are thinking John Wayne, right? That's who I would have guessed. But the most famous cowboy in history wasn't an outlaw, wasn't a lawman, wasn't a musician, and wasn't a famous actor. So who's the world's most famous cowboy? His name is Daryl Winfield, a rancher from Wyoming. And although most likely you've never heard of his name, you will recognize his silhouette. Gentlemen, I'm talking about the Marlboro Man. And from 1968 to 1989, over a 30 year run, Daryl was that man. We saw this on billboards, it was in magazines, it was everywhere. You would go to you know, East Europe, you would go into parts of Africa, and people knew who the Marlboro Man was. Now the thing about Daryl Winfield is he actually wasn't an actor. He was a ranch hand, I believe at the time, in Montana. And he was spotted by the guys over at the Leo Barnett Company. And they were so impressed that this guy, he intimidated them. He looked like the perfect cowboy. They were able to capture it on film. They were able to capture tons of pictures. And this became the iconic look of the cowboy for most people in the world. Today's video, gents, we're talking about cowboy history. We're talking about how the cowboy ethos took over American culture in the 1950s. We're going to talk about why the ladies love cowboys, and I'm going to give you some practical tips, a little bit of advice on how to bring cowboy clothing into your modern wardrobe if you so choose. Guys, you ready? Let's do this. So the first question is, why in the world are they even called cowboys? I mean, they ride horses. Shouldn't they be called horse boys? No. Let's go back to the 16th century. The Spanish bring horses over to the Americas. And we see in Mexico, what is now California, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, all of a sudden herding, ranching, being able to raise livestock. It's a very valuable skill. And we had a particular type of profession that popped up, vaqueros, and the vaqueros were the cowboys. These guys had particular roping skills. They could ride, they could herd in a way that they actually earned that name and that distinction. Now, over the next 200 years, there's a lot of chaos in the Americas. We saw the independence of Mexico. We saw the formation of Texas. We saw the United States have a war with Mexico. And we saw all of the basically borders change up. But what really didn't change were the skills, were the things that were needed till all of a sudden the railroads started expanding west. This was the whole manifest destiny in the United States. And all of a sudden it became profitable to move cattle out east up towards Chicago to the slaughterhouses. And there was a lot of money here. This is when we saw basically the cattle rise of the cattle baron. $40 a head is what some of these cowboys were getting. And they were pushing in hundreds, if not, you know, a thousand cows at a time. This was big business, a lot of money. And there was also a lot of chaos because where there's a lot of money, there's a lot of people that want to come in and want to take advantage of the situation. You saw the rise of the outlaws. We saw just a lot of lawlessness. This was the time of the real wild, wild, West. By the 1890s, however, this way of life started to disappear. A big part of it was privatized land. We saw barbed wire up all over the place and it just became less profitable to be able to drive the herds up north. Now, at this point, the cowboy could have just become a footnote in history, but something interesting happened in 1903 called The Great Train Robbery. This was a silent film that was 12 minutes long that changed everything for the cowboy. Because this film, it's hard to understand it today, but this was watched by pretty much every single person in the United States and in many other parts of Europe and the world. And for the first time, people were able to see this film. And it was action packed for the time. This was something that no one was pretty controlled. A lot of them were boring. No, in this one, we had violence, we had action, we had all these looks that people over in Europe and other parts of the world had never seen. And all of a sudden, the cowboy became cemented as an iconic figure. And it was from the 1930s to the late 1960s that Western had its golden era in Hollywood. Starting in 1939, we saw films like John Ford's Stagecoach, 1946's Duel in the Sun, 1952's High Noon, 1953's Shane, which if you were a young man and you didn't know this movie, yeah, you were, you had to watch this thing. And in these Westerns, we saw some of the biggest actors of the time. And again, this was a time when everybody went to the movies. This was the form of entertainment. You had names like John Wayne all of a sudden become synonymous with 
the man of the West. The good, the bad, the ugly. I mean, who hasn't heard of this with Clint Eastwood? Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Amazing movie. If you haven't watched it, the ending, not going to spoil it for you. It is amazing. Yeah, two guys versus the whole Bolivian army. And with the rise of television, there wasn't a kid in the United States that didn't know about the Lone Ranger and Tonto. And even in modern cinema, the Western is still a genre that's unto itself. Movies like Unforgiven, in my opinion, one of the best Westerns ever made and perhaps Clint Eastwood's best film ever. 2007's No Country for Old Men. This one, not a traditional, more of a modern Western, but still, if you haven't seen that movie, I'm not going to spoil it for you. Friggin' amazing. And a quick shout out to a few of my other favorite modern Westerns, Hell or High Water, amazing film. Two from Quentin Tarantino, The Hateful Eight and Django Unchanged. And if you've got daughters and want to show them what a strong woman looks like, check out 2010's True Grit. Haley Steinfeld, an amazing performance. And I'm going to throw in 2018's The Ballad of Buster Shrugs. If you like a little bit of humor, if you like something that's a little bit, yeah, different, but still like, wow, check it out. An amazing film. Now, if you've watched my channel for a while, you probably know that I'm from a small town in West Texas called Greenwood. It's right outside of Midland, Texas. And I grew up around people that basically were ranchers, people that had all types of animals. There were tons of kickers that went to my school. That's what we called the cowboys and cowgirls. And, uh, you know, they had their own style. They had their own look. But one time I remember a friend of mine, she wore a shirt that said, cowboy butts drive me wild. And it just made me laugh because once you worked school, but the other one is like, why do the ladies love cowboys? Well, there's a couple reasons. Well, first up, it definitely has to do with Hollywood and the romanticizing of the cowboy genre. You go to a romance novel area and look around, half of them are going to be women in the arms of a cowboy. So when you see this enough times, there's definitely a lot of marketing into this. In fact, I found an interesting article from a publisher talking about, yeah, cowboy romance novels have always sold well, especially if they have the word Texas in the title. So there you go. But in that same article, they go deeper. They say that really, I'd venture to say it's that the ideal image of cowboys being heroic, silent, smart, that draws women in. And I want to reinforce that it was actually two women that were stating this. To sum it up, they said that women dream of being held in the arms of a strong, rugged cowboy and that men actually dream of being that idyllic version of the cowboy women fawn over. Now, how much of that's true? I don't know, but they did end it with this. Cowboys work hard. They get things done. They're respectful and they dress nice. Boots and cowboy hats. And with that, gentlemen, let's now talk about particular items in a cowboy's wardrobe, items that maybe you could even bring into yours. First up, let's talk about the cowboy boot. I know a lot of Texans are going to say, Antonio, what you're about to say is sacrilegious, but guys, we did not invent the cowboy boot. It was actually the English and the Germans that brought over two particular styles that the cowboy boot was inspired by. So, the Wellington boot from the English and then the Hessian boot from the Germans. Both of these came over during the Revolutionary War and these were boots that made their way out west. Now, initially, uh, Western boots didn't even have a left or a right foot. What a lot of Texans don't want to admit is that actually Kansas had a huge play in the Western boot. And I think it was 1870 census. There were 98 boot makers apparently in Texas and over 120 in Kansas. And the reason being, again, all that cattle was being driven up north. And once you were paid, once you delivered that cattle, guess what? There were tons of vendors and boot makers and other clothing manufacturers right there so you could spend your money and it would immediately go into your wardrobe. Now, the early Western boots, they were actually shorter. They didn't have as you know high right here of a shaft, and this is the shaft in case you're wondering, of the boot. It was something that it was a lot more expensive, but the higher the shaft, the better it gave protection of the up, you know, the lower part of the leg. Now, the best boot makers out West were actually immigrants coming over from Europe. So, you had Italians, you had English, you had a number of Germans coming in. And what we saw is that they were spending a lot more time on the intricacies, on the details. And to this day, if you go over to companies like Rocket Buster in El Paso, you just see these guys spend a, these are works of art when it comes to the design of the upper, of the overall shaft, the design of the boot. And these boots are expensive. We're talking some of them over $20,000 a pair. Now, the history is all great, but why is the boot still around? Because it's still functional. One of the things you're going to notice with Western boots is there's no lacing. 
and that means the boot can be slipped on and off. That's important if you're riding a horse, you don't want to get dragged to your death and it's happened. It used to be a big thing you had to worry about. So guess what? The boots, if they get caught into something, you can slide right out of them. That was a big reason why they were made the way they were made to be uh, designed. Also, we've got the heel right here. Why do you have a heel on boots? Well, so that it goes right and fits right into a saddle. Whenever you're sitting, uh, basically right there, the stirrups, you want this to fit right in there and stay in place. Now with toe designs, there's going to be a variety of different looks. You're going to see square toes. You're going to see chisel toes. You're going to see the curved toe. Me personally, I like the look of the curved toe, but I understand why people go with the chisel, why they go actually with a square, why in the actually parts of Mexico, check this boot out right here. This is all about showmanship and yes, it is way over the top, but it can also be a style aspect of the boot. Now, what if you're from New York City and just moved to Austin, Texas? You're from Houston, Texas and you're relocating out to LA. Is it worth actually wearing Western boots? Why should a modern man have this in his wardrobe? So first up, you can go with a very muted pair. And from a distance, most people aren't even going to notice. What I love about boots is the heel. This right here is going to give you an inch to two inches of additional height. It's going to slim up a guy that's got a little bit of weight around the midsection. It's just going to make you look taller, more masculine. Another thing, a lot of people don't talk about this, but boots in, can be incredibly comfortable because the way that they're made to fit is right here in the toe box and the back of the heel, you give yourself a little bit of room when it comes to style. I had a story, I read it somewhere, of a guy in London wearing boots and people trying to buy them right off him in, you know, the tube. It is one of those things that it is an iconic style look. I think boots are one of the easiest things to actually incorporate into your wardrobe from the look of the iconic cowboy. I don't know. Agree? Disagree? Let me know in the comments below. You guys know I love hearing from you. The next iconic piece of clothing in a cowboy's wardrobe, the Western hat. Now, a cowboy hat is a high crowned, wide brimmed hat that above all is functional. Whenever you're out in the sun, it is going to keep it off of your head, off of your face, and it really helps keep things a bit cooler. That's what the whole high crown is for. It allows air to circulate. So you would see a number of hats were made from actually a breathable material would either have holes in there if they were made from felt or were made from straw. So just air could pass through. It actually evolved from the sombrero, although we saw in many early pictures, a lot of uh, Eastern or in Western European hats being used. We even saw, yeah, look at it. You see bowlers that were worn out West. Historically, you saw a wide variety of headwear being used. It really depended on the style, what the gentleman wanted to wear, what was going to actually protect him from the elements, what worked in his settings, in his situations. It was a pretty much a motley crew out West historically, whenever it came to what actually cowboys wore. So the big question here is, can you bring this into your wardrobe? Unlike boots, I think Western hats, cowboy hats, very difficult to pull off unless you have worn them, you've practiced wearing them, and you have the confidence. Do I think that you actually need to be a cowboy to be able to pull this off? No, I think that if you've got the cowboy within your heart, then go for it. But understand that this is something that's going to, you are going to be a focal point, especially if you're wearing this in an area where it's not worn very often. Here, even in the Midwest, in a rural town, nobody wears a Western hat. That being said, you down in Texas, they're a lot more common over in Oklahoma, New Mexico. I think that with a bolo tie, you could probably, yeah, you could definitely pull that off. But again, you need to be able to have confidence to be able to rock this. Now, gents, if you're enjoying today's video, I would greatly appreciate it if you would smash the like button. This lets the YouTube algorithms, the gods know that, hey, this is a great video from Antonio. You want to see more like this and it helps me keep score so that I can determine what videos I'm going to make next. Next up, let's talk about the cowboy shirt. Now, historically, cowboys pretty much wore whatever long sleeve shirt they could get their hands on. There were a variety of styles, but most of them were made from a hard wearing cotton denim like this now. This is a modern stylish one that, you know, has all the snaps on it and stuff. But this did become really popular in the 1970s. Denim is going to be noted because it's usually heavier in weight, meaning it's just thicker and it's rougher wearing. Although after a few, you know, maybe dozen washes, it gets really soft. Cotton in general is what we see on most modern Western shirts. You'll find that the fit on most Western wear is pretty close and that is a functionality aspect because you want to have high armholes so that you can actually raise your arms up and you never want excess material that could catch onto something. And personally, that's what I love most about Western wear. It is functional 
first. Yes, it looks good and there's an iconic look here with the cowboy, but everything he wore was simply about being able to get the job done. So, can the modern man bring in the western shirt? You bet he can. One of the easiest items to bring into your wardrobe and it doesn't have to be made from denim. Anything that's a bit more casual, maybe it's got, you know, a little bit, you know, the double pockets, maybe it doesn't, maybe it's just simply, it almost looks like a dress shirt but made from a hardier material. You'll see tons of variations out there and I think it's one of the easiest things to bring into your wardrobe. Next up, let's talk about denim. We'll talk about jeans in particular. Nowadays, this is associated with the cowboy. Historically, though, you know, jeans, you know, were starting to make their time, make their way out in San Francisco at about the time of the rise of the cowboy, but they wore a variety of different options. You had cowboys wearing wool trousers. They were wearing anything that would protect their legs, anything that was hardy, anything that could deal with the elements and the dust. And there was a lot of that. So you wanted something that was functional, something that was relatively inexpensive, something could be patched up because you were probably going to tear it. Nowadays, I think that Wrangler pretty much has the market on the Western kind of cowboy type of jean. Uh, and in general, these are going to be fitting very close. That's why, you know, my, my friend, her shirt, cowboy butts drive me nuts because cowboys and Western men oftentimes wear jeans that fit them close. I talked about fit with the shirt, the same thing with jeans. You don't want anything loose, anything with excess material that can get caught. You want something that's going to basically fit you form fitted in the crotch area. So, your legs will actually have full freedom of movement and you just get used to that closer fit. And again, if you're in good shape, you're a relatively young man and you've got a little bit of a backside, let's just say that the ladies love it. Now, what about vests? You'll see these in a lot of movies. Vests were very functional. In fact, the origination of the vest was from messengers that were wrapping fabric around their core area. They understood, hey, I have to cover my core. This is, if you keep this warm, your extremities, everything else is going to be fine. Um, Cowboys understood this. This was also great because it provided an extra layer of protection in their torso area from just anything. It would, it would tighten things up. But vests were not as popular as what Hollywood makes them out to be. They do bring together a look. I love the look of a vest, but I would assume maybe for the Western gambler, um, he would maybe wear a vest because he could afford it. But for a lot of cowboys, it was just something that was outside of their uh, ability to afford. Nowadays, though, in the modern man's wardrobe, I think vests are friggin' amazing, totally underused. And if you wanted to add one item to your wardrobe, maybe look to bring in a vest. It really sets you apart from the crowd and they're, like I said, incredibly functional because they free up the arms. I've got entire infographics you can see here on vests, which I will link to down in the description of today's video. Guys, if you haven't been over to Real Men Real Style, my website, it's friggin' amazing. We have so many infographics, 2,000 articles that you can go through and check out, just tons of solid info, free eBooks. Just, yeah, go over to my website if you want to learn more about men's style. I've got entire articles about boots, about yeah, Western wear. So, go check it out. Really a, a great resource and it's free. Now, what about the red around the neck, the bandana? Was this like the cowboy's necktie? Yes and no. So, it did bring kind of the outfit together, did add some color. So, there was a little bit of a stylish aspect of the bandana, but most old school bandanas weren't worn because they were bright colored. They were worn because they were incredibly functional. If you put the bandana in this area because you wanted to keep dust from caking onto your skin, it was incredibly uncomfortable and it just was an added layer of protection. In addition, in a, you know, in a pinch, you could use it as a tourniquet. You could use it to, to wipe your to sweat off your brow. There are so many functions. It was just a very useful piece of gear that uh, probably most cowboys actually did carry. All right, guys, so what video to watch next? Well, check out why are mafia bosses so stylish? I go into it right here in this video, go into the history, the details, and how you can actually bring some mafia style into your wardrobe without looking like you're going to, you know, yeah, uh, make somebody go sleep with the fishes. Go check it out, guys. It's a great video. I really enjoyed putting it together. Take care. I'll see you in the next video.